Welcome to Conversation on Value, a podcast on traces and dreams about reframing value in business and society. I'm your host, Valeria Maltoni. In this episode, we'll explore the question of value in multilingualism in culture with Rosemary Salomone, the Kenneth Wong Professor of Law at St. John's University School of Law. Conversation on Value is a podcast about how to reframe value in business and society. I'm Valeria and I've been working on the question of value for more than 20 years. So welcome. I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here. And as I was reading your book, I was thinking, what language should the world speak? Because it's not so easy, is it? Well, it, it's, it's very difficult for me as an American and a native English language speaker to say, well, the world should speak English because, you know, it, it does now. It, it's kind of like this horse is out of the barn and we can't reel it back in again. Um, but the truth is English has become the, the common language, the lingua franca. And I admit there's a, a somewhat dark history behind it, you know, based in, in colonialism and a lot of cultural uh, hegemony. Uh, but the fact is that it, it is a common language and there are many benefits to it. But what I wanted to show in the book that there you, you have to take a more balanced look. We could look at all the benefits to it, but there really is a downside to it as well. Uh, there's a downside for Anglophones like me and, and like many Americans uh, who think that, well, all we need is language, English. English can do it all, but it really can't. And what we see here in the United States and in countries in the UK as well, or in Australia, what we see here is a downplay of foreign languages so that fewer and fewer students are being encouraged to learn foreign languages. But even despite the pushback on globalization, globalization is still a reality. And there are so many opportunities for young people in terms of job opportunities, but cultural opportunities as well, uh, political opportunities. So much is lost by relying just on one language. Um, and I wanted to show that in terms of the benefits and burdens on both sides of the issue. And on the other side, that children in other countries are learning English, there's an educational problem here. Because in many countries, children, particularly in emerging economies like India and African countries, children are being forced to learn in English from the beginning of schooling because their parents really believe that this is the way to economic and social mobility. And so children are learning in a language that they don't understand. And there's so much research working against it the children have to learn in the language, whether we call it their mother tongue or the language that's spoken in their home in the community, the language they're familiar with. And then you can gradually move them into English because English does have this value in, in this economic value and this social value. Uh, and that was the point of the book. I wanted to show both sides of the English question. So it, it, I'm smiling because you were talking about children uh, learning English uh, at an early age. And my first, um, first of all, we didn't learn English until middle school. So I was already a little bit older, uh, which is why I retained my accent <laughs> throughout my life. Um, and, but I remember listening to songs, popular songs uh, and music, pop music. And uh, of course the lyrics were in English. Uh, but um, so we sort of parroted the lyrics, but we really didn't understand as much uh, what the songs were about. And later in life, when I went back to those songs, I was a little bit um, disappointed in some cases uh, uh, in terms of, oh, wow, there wasn't as much here as I thought there was. Um, and there was a disconnect between, you know, what I thought it was and, and uh, what it was. And uh, that was a little bit of, um, of a surprise uh, for me. But a lot of the media, uh, a lot of the shows that came in, in, uh, to Italy where I grew up were dubbed. So there wasn't, there wasn't uh, we didn't have the ability to absorb the language in context. 
as some other, for example, the Dutch um, and other cultures uh, do with the subtitles. And I was wondering whether um, there was there were advantages, disadvantages to one way or the other. Oh, I think there were severe disadvantages, but may, maybe I'm wrong. The dubbing was a holdover from fascism. And maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> but that was my understanding. Uh, and then it just took on a life of its own and became much easier for Italians and for the French too, uh, to view uh, American movies where you're absorbing the culture, but you're not absorbing the language. Uh, whereas the Dutch, and you could say, well, Dutch is a much smaller language. So there was more meaning that there are not as many world speakers of Dutch, particularly the Netherlands and the Nordic, Nordic countries like Sweden and Denmark, um, where there was more incentive for people to learn English. Uh, and there, and there's much more English, greater English fluency in those populations than there are among the French or among the Italians. Uh, but part of it was this incentive that they had to learn a big language, a language that had more economic value. Uh, and so they learned English. Uh, and, and part of that was not dubbing their films or dubbing their TV programs. So those children were, I, when I speak to some uh, adults in, in Europe, they tell me they learned English through cartoons or they <laughs> learned as children, or they learned English through music. Um, but for the Italians, it was slow going in acquiring English. I, I think it's catching on now because Italian parents realize how important it is for their children to, to speak English. So you went and you used the, this lens of education uh, to look into uh, Europe and particularly uh, your research started with France and Italy, um, the two countries you mentioned, and you know the, the pushback on teaching courses uh, in English. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, part of the book. Uh, do you wanna uh, take me through how that all? Sure, uh, the chapter on Shakespeare and the Crossfire. Uh, the idea of the book started in the spring of 2013. Uh, I noted in, I guess it was news articles, these two legal issues brewing uh, in both France and Italy. Uh, in France, it had to do with um, loosening the limitations on teaching in a language other than French uh, in French universities. Uh, and that caused a, a real conflict. It, it was a, a high level dramatic controversy within the legislature and among the intellectual elite that you know, France was really the language of culture and diplomacy, which it was for many years. Uh, and that uh, French is the language of, it, it's in the constitution uh, in more recent decades. It, it was really when France was entering uh, the European Union that France was placed, carved into the constitution as the official language of the country. Uh, and that to be French, you had to speak French. Uh, in Italy, uh, it had to do with a court case uh, and built on the decision of the Polytechnic Institute, the Politecnico in Milano, to transfer all their graduate programs, master's programs and PhD programs into English totally within two years. And so uh, about 100, it, the, the number became smaller as the litigation went on, but about 100 professors challenged it in court. And so I watched that litigation go through the courts over the course of maybe about six years. Uh, I did visit the Politecnico and I did, I became, I became familiar with some of the professors who were challenging the program. Uh, I spent a day there, I visited classrooms, I interviewed people, I interviewed students. Uh, one particular professor who was really leading the charge, I guess you could say, uh, he very generously kept supplying me with the court decisions as they were coming down. Uh, so it, it was going, you know, went through the 
uh, local administrative court, the regional administrative court, the administrative court in uh, in Rome. It went then it was sent over to the constitutional court because there was a constitutional question. Went back to the administrative court. So this was, I mean, there were many court decisions, but in the end, the constitutional court said that uh, teachers have the right to teach in the language of their country, Italian, and students have the right to learn in the language of their country. Italian. That didn't change things much at the Politecnico. I mean, if you look on their website today, still a, a, a large majority of their courses are, are being taught in English and not in Italian. Then there were some courses that are being offered in both. But that uh, the, through the course of that litigation, that also created this stir among some of the intellectual elite uh, in Italy as well. Uh, and and the professors at the at the Politecnico, and so I found those two. It would look like, you know, the, the, it was as I said in the book, it was reverberating across the Alps. <laughs> this idea of English just you know coming into these countries uh, and becoming so dominant, uh, and one side embracing it and the other side just rejecting it, and so that's what started with uh, looking at those two cases, at the similarities and the contrast to them at all. And what I did find, which I really, I found very interesting, there was um, a study done at one point uh, asking Italians, Dutch and French uh, to what extent they believe their language was tied to their national identity, how strong they felt about you know, their language and their national identity. And the Italians felt the least strong about it. Maybe it was about 54%, 59%. Uh, the French, it was in the 70s. And the Dutch, it was in the 80s. So the Dutch, despite their being so fluent in English, seemed to have the strongest feelings about their language is tied to what it meant to be Dutch. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the contrast among those three countries, and then after doing that chapter, then there, there was um, a, a court case that was brought in the Netherlands, too, and at that point, I was really interested in the legal questions, uh, and so I started investigating that and interviewing the, uh, the, the cast of characters in that drama, uh, and, and devoted another chapter just to the, to, to the Netherlands, uh, and, and, and I still watch that. In fact, uh, there'll be a piece coming out in University World News this week on the Netherlands that I just put together as to you know how that issue seems to be evolving in the Netherlands. Well, it's interesting because uh, communication started very local, right? And then with the advent of fast trains, uh, it picked up speed. And now communication is based on technology that is hatched mostly in an English speaking uh, country. Um, so a lot of these, um, you know, especially young people uh, in Italy, in France, in Netherlands, all over the world, um, they have to learn, you know, some of the terminology in order to uh, get into the technology piece. Oh, yeah. I mean, technology is so driven by English. Science is dri driven by English. When you look at uh, scientific publications, they're almost universally not, well, uh, I'd say a large percentage of them are now in English. And for scientists, in order for them to convey their, their scholarship and their findings to the world, they really have to publish in English. Uh, it, it's just become a matter of course. For academics, it's become a matter of course. I mean, it used to be I would go to conferences in Europe, uh, and the most of the presentations, or at least uh, many of them, would be in the native language, and everybody would get headsets, you know, and so it, you, you'd have interpretation and translation. That has changed dramatically. Largely, those conferences are being held in English, which really puts um, academics from those countries at a disadvantage uh, because their presentations are not as uh, fluid, not, not as filled with nuance and humor as those of us who speak English well. Uh, they just don't communicate as effectively. You know, if I had to give a, a presentation in French or Italian, it would be very scripted. It would be very 
wooden. Uh, and that's what those young, particularly young academics are finding that if they don't speak English well, they're put at a, a severe disadvantage uh, professionally. You mentioned humor and because I have done simultaneous interpreting work, um, it, it's really hard to translate jokes because jokes are the most contextually based um, uh, forms of communication and they are rooted uh, in a reality that is quite nuanced and it's very culturally uh, relevant, but may not transfer as well into another culture uh, in the same way. So I, I became very fluent in sort of transposing uh, jokes and making sure that my Italian, uh, the Italian audience understood where it was coming from. That has to be a real challenge. It is. You're, 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 you're translating not just the language, you're translating the culture. And, I, and having grown up with um, three grandparents who were Italian immigrants, you know, I, I kind of understand that there were some things that were just so culturally bound that even phrases, I, you know, you just don't, you can't translate. It's just, um, it's just very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it's, well, Italian is very localized too uh, because of its history, uh, right? <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I mean, localized down to the village. <laughs> yes. That's how localized yes. it is. Yeah. So, so there is this connection, this link between language and national identity. Um, and so, I'm wondering, um, you know, what's is is the identity going to shift? Is the language? It's you know, it's a very interesting uh, conundrum, uh, I guess, or dilemma. Um, that that worries me, even as an Anglophone. You know, I I worry about whether the Dutch will really feel Dutch any longer, or the 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 Italians Italians or the French French, uh, or the uh, you know a, any other group South the South Americans will you know to what extent will they be tied to their own uh, country's culture or or Hispanic culture or not. I think that remains to be seen as to what extent you can maintain the culture when you start using the language. And, and the fear is among some people that these languages are only going to be used for uh, informal conversation, that they're going to become small languages, that, that they're not going to be used uh, for economic, in diplomacy or in business or in, in scholarship and in, in, in the actual intellectual life. Uh, and they're going to even lose terminology. They're, they're, as you were saying, um, so much of technology is built on English and, and English terms. So those other countries are not keeping pace with the de developments in science or, or the developments in technology. So to what extent are those languages just going to become much more limited to informal con conversation and not be used in business any longer. I mean, you see some countries uh, or some companies, foreign companies moving totally to English. R Rakuten, the uh, Japanese country, they converted their entire operation into English, totally, totally. But there are other countries in um, abroad that are using English as their business language. So if you don't speak English, you just don't work there. Or you don't you're not you're not getting promoted. But it's not just the language, right? You were talking about culture, so it's the entire con contextual piece that a um, somebody who uh, speaks English as a second language or a third language uh, is at, at a disadvantage. Uh, they have to catch up on the culture, don't they? Well, I mean, there's this this question as to whether English is becoming unmoored from its American roots or its British roots. That English of itself, that maybe there's another variety of English that's being developed because so many people are speaking it as a second language, that there could be world Englishes, more than one form of English that might be accepted. 
maybe that could be in the far future. I think for now, um, it's going to be standard English and, and it's becoming more and more American standard English in terms of spelling and particular words that we use as compared to British English. But there is this idea that maybe English is not tied to American culture any longer. I think what, what, what makes that a little bit difficult is that American culture is so pervasive around the world coming through, it used to be through Hollywood. It used to be through American films for many years, but now there's the social media. Uh, and so people around the world are accessing American culture, however you want to define it, in a much, a much easier way on a, on a daily, it's a daily diet, a steady diet of it. So how, however people feel about it, I think Amer American culture, aside from the language, is connected to the language, but there are all these sources of the culture itself as soft power uh, mm -hmm. around the world uh, that still is very active and, it, it, and, and very dominant. Uh, I was thinking about Esperanto. Uh, at some point, the world thought that we're going to make up another language so that everybody could speak it. But now, you know, you're, what you're saying is English may detach itself because it's so pervasive all over the world, may detach itself from any specific culture. And then you have like a Japanese English, you have an Italian English, a French English, and so Maybe. on. Yeah, yeah. But, so, but, you know, Esperanto was thought to be neutral. It was politically, politically neutral. English is anything but politically neutral. And that's, yeah, that's the, that's the concern um, that you brought up when you talked about Europe and all of these cases, because there is an understanding that, yes, uh, English can uh, provide some advantages, uh, but in English, in addition to uh, local languages, so multilingualism, and one section of the book, uh, you have uh, all the advantages of being bilingual or multilingual. Um, and I thought that were um, interesting. Um, do you want to talk about that part of the research? Well, there's lots of data on the marketability of English. You know, English has become, language has become commodified. Uh, and there, there's lots of data on the marketability of English, but also on the marketability of multilingualism as well. So I try to treat that both to address both those questions uh, in the book. Uh, but certainly many countries, many multinational countries are looking abroad, are looking for workers who can speak English, who are proficient in English. Uh, but then again, many multinational countries here as well in the US are looking for workers who speak other languages. So there's such a, a market value in languages that and cannot be underestimated. Uh, there's also the value in terms of diplomacy. If in fact, uh, leaders, uh, national leaders can speak English and then communicate in a common language with leaders from other countries, it really is more effective. Uh, it, Pressed me when I saw Volodymyr Zelensky uh, address the US uh, Congress uh, and the UK Parliament in English. You know, I understand it was it's probably scripted for him, but you could you could see that that, that there was a, a closer link in term, it, it was more compelling. He was trying to appeal to the Anglo to the Anglophone world, to the UK and to the United States to maintain its support for Ukraine and to keep helping Ukraine win the war against, against Russia. Uh, and it, it seemed to me that that appeal was really went to the heart of these people, if he could communicate with them in their own language. Or you see someone like uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, in France, whose English is really quite, he's really proficient in English, uh, and very often when he'll address, when he came to the United States and addressed a group, he, he spoke in French, but when he's speaking to world leaders in a, a less formal sense, he's speaking English because that's the common language. So there is this advantage to a common language, uh, but then again, there's also this advantage 
uh, an advantage to speaking the language of others uh, as well. So it's, you know, diplomatic uses, um, business uh, for sure, uh, scientific uses. You wonder when you see how the, um, the first vaccine, the COVID vaccine was rolled out, both in Europe and in the United States. Uh, it was a collaboration between uh, Pfizer, which is a, a US pharmaceutical company, and BioNTech, which is a biotech company uh, in Germany. Uh, and you wonder if that could have been done if they didn't have a common language, the scientists themselves. Uh, and the two leading scientists in Germany were uh, the children of Turkish immigrants. So you see how this all comes kind of full circle and the world is much smaller than we think it is. Uh, and so I think language contributes a, a, a lot to in, in a lot of areas. It's interesting you were talking about uh, the Germany piece and I was thinking when I read Enrico Fermi's biography, um, The Pope uh, of Physics, uh, in it, you know, when he became uh, a physicist, uh, he, did, he didn't have uh, anybody else, you know, Italy didn't really have an established scientific community at the time. So he started publishing in German and then in English. Uh, so he taught himself <laughs> the languages in addition to uh, looking into the science in order to publish and connect with his peers uh, in the scientific community. Well, you, you certainly have a a larger landscape on which you know you could paint your views uh, if you speak other languages. What we forget, though, there is that there is this, just this, uh, as you know, being a bilingual, this um, personal enjoyment in accessing the culture of other peoples through their language, of just reading their literature. When you read, I'm sure you've read. Uh, some works originally in Italian and then the translation in English. And it really does pale in comparison. When I think of, as a, as a young student, uh, I read the Divine Comedy, the Divino Commedia, Dante's Divino Commedia uh, in Italian. And then now picking it up and, and reading it in English, it's just not the same. It's I just... have not found a good English translation of La Divina Commedia. Uh... <laughs> By the best we, of we translators. Yeah, yeah, by the best of translators, seriously. Yeah. It, yeah. Just, it, it loses the rhythm. It loses don, the, the rhythm itself. It's just not the same. Yeah. But even modern, um, modern literature, I've tried uh, one of Elena Ferrante's books, uh, reading it in English. First, I read it in English, and then I read it in Italian, and it was very different was very different. For me, it was Alessandro Barbero, the historian. Um, I've, I've listened, I listened to all of his talks because people put his videos online and eventually, you know, the national TV understood that he was a treasure and now he is on national TV. But he has like these very passionate talks about historical events and he, tell, he, he tells the stories. And so I know his voice. And I picked up a book on the Battle of Waterloo translated into English. And I know he has like a specific translator and I just could not hear his voice come through in yep. the English version. Yep. Yeah, what I, thought, what I thought was really interesting in the Elena Ferrante books is that there's so much Neapolitan dialect in her books. That that's not that can't be translated, and so you lose that because you know. I mean, if you're Italian, you know when Italian speakers kick into <laughs> the local language, and it's it, it, there's there's a certain uh, visceral element to it uh, that's totally lost in the English translation, and yet it's really so. I think it's so critical to her stories. It, it is because, understanding the characters. Yes, because exactly, they pro it provides the context for for the identity of the characters, who they are, and how they see themselves, and exactly. how they relate to the world. Yeah, exactly. Now we've talked about a lot of the world coming into 
uh, the English <laughs> the English language and translating their work. But you in the book you also talk about three different examples of um, bilingual uh, or multilingual programs uh, here in America. Uh, and I thought I I actually didn't know uh, about um, two of them. Um, so th that was fascinating. I have a background uh, in teaching English to foreigners, to foreign students. As, as a graduate student, I taught in the American language program at Columbia University, uh, but I also developed bilingual, before going to law school, attending law school and becoming a law professor, um, I developed bilingual programs for immigrant students uh, in New York City. So I've always had some interest in the education of immigrant children and the book before the rise of English, uh, True American was really on the education of Im immigrant children. Uh, and so going back into that world uh, was interesting for me and seeing what had developed in the intervening years. Uh, and this concept of dual language immersion was, was really fascinated me because I think it took, it addressed some of the problems of bilingual education itself Whereas in bilingual education, you're really isolating these children. You're taking them out of the mainstream. And the idea is you know, to use their, their home language and gradually transition them into English. But in the meantime, you're really you know, segregating them based upon their, uh, their language and their culture, you know, ultimately their culture. Whereas dual language, you, you're mixing these two groups together. You're mixing native language, native English language speaking children uh, and children who don't speak English, speak another language. And they're in the same classroom working together uh, with, with two teachers, you know, one who's a native English speaker and the other a native speaker or a proficient speaker of the other language. Uh, and to me, it seemed like it, it really addressed many of the flaws in the old concept of bilingual education. So then going back into that world, uh, I find I found Utah to be extraordinarily interesting, uh, and in each of these, in each of the chapters for the book, I, I did a, a number of interviews, um, most of them through Zoom. Uh, a good portion of the book, toward the end, was done during the pandemic, so I had no personal, you know, no no ability to travel or or, or contact people personally, um, and so talking to the the, the people in Utah. So much of that was driven by the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, what used to be called the Mormon Church, where they send their young people on a mission. And so they have always been very attuned to developing language skills uh, in their young population. Uh, and as a result of that, you, many corporations are moving into Utah, multinational corporations, because they know they have multilingual speakers there. Uh, and a, a, a lot of the drive behind these dual language programs in Utah uh, had to do with the support of that community, of that religious community. Uh, in California, it was a, an interesting case study because there was a, there's a high number of um, Spanish speaking students in California because they're so near the Mexican border. Um, and there was a point where uh, California had adopted a law that really limited bilingual education severely. And yet it turned around through another referendum. It kind of mobilized this, uh, this support for bilingual education. It took them years to do it. Uh, but in this overwhelming vote, they were able to <clears throat> tip, just turn that around completely. Uh, and you get the sense that this was a group of people who were very dedicated to this population. And then in New York City, that was just totally eye-opening because it was, it was driven by the French-speaking population of New York City, who, it, they're not a very politically active population here at all in New York or visible, uh, but these were parents who were looking for a relatively inexpensive way to, to maintain their children's language and culture uh, and doing it through the public schools. And so they engaged the public schools of New York City to develop these dual language programs in French, but
but from there, the concept spread to other language groups as well. Uh, and so again, it was it was a, 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 this confluence of forces here in New York City where they originally approached a woman in one particular school in Brooklyn whose mother was French and was raised bilingually, and she felt very passionate about the idea. They start the program in that one school, and then it just completely explodes with, with the support of the French embassy. Yes, it's. I know there is also a very active business community, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, there's entrepreneurs associations uh, for um, French uh, businesses in New York, uh, particularly the startup community. And you mentioned, right. I think, that Macron uh, um, came to, when he came to New York, he was uh, very enthusiastic about the program. He was, and, and I was able to, um, it was difficult to get an invitation to his, the talk at the, the City University Graduate Center, but I did. And I was able to get a front row seat. He was pretty new to the presidency at the time. Uh, and he was extraordinarily compelling. And what touched me, and I mentioned this in the book, is that uh, here was the president of France uh, promoting bilingualism, you know, in New York City. Uh, and the City University of New York had, has been called in the past the American dream machine, because that was the institution. At one time, it was totally tuition free, but that was the institution uh, through which many young immigrants, you know, the, the, the children of immigrants that had come to the United States 100 years ago, that was their vehicle for higher education. Uh, and so this was, and, and but, but they were a population that was told not to learn their parents' language, that to be truly American, you had to speak English. And here we have the president of France standing there, you know, in this hall of the, of the graduate center, praising bilingualism. No, it's interesting because you were saying that and I was imagining the Statue of Liberty <laughs> in the background, right? There is, so there is this connection uh, between, between uh, France and uh, New York City, uh, but definitely the, the waves of immigrants. Now I'm, I'm thinking more, I'm more familiar with the Italian immigrants. Uh, those were rough times. Uh, when, when people came into Ellis Island and they had to, you know, kind of, quote, unquote, be Americanized and integrated. It was very difficult. And, and, and they were poor. They were largely Southern Italians. And with Southern Italians, it was Eastern Europeans. Uh, and they were poor. And many of them were uneducated. Uh, and, the, and the streets were not lined with gold, as they thought they would be. I mean, life was very difficult. But it also gave an opportunity for their children and their grandchildren because they were escaping poverty. And, and, and for the Jews, they were escaping persecution uh, as well. But for the Italians, it was totally economic. It wasn't political, uh, but, but given where they, come from, they came from, they were giving their children and their, grand, and their grandchildren opportunity. You know, to me, I speak more than one language and to me, the answer is no. Uh, but I wonder about uh, monolinguals and people who speak only English and what, what have you found their perception to be? I think many monolingual Anglophones are very content with being, <laughs> with being monolingual. I mean, they really do believe, well, let's face it, you can travel to any country. You go through the airport, any airport in a major city and there's signage in English. You know, you, you, you travel down the streets of major cities and there are advertisements. And, you know, we, we see now there's pushback in Italy about the introduction of so many English words. Uh, there's, there's pushback in France as well. Um, but it's so easy for English speakers to travel the world. Uh, you go into shops in foreign cities and somebody will speak English. So you really don't, I think the, the assumption is, I don't need to speak another language. What they don't understand is how much they do lose. I mean, not only through the beauty of other languages and, and accessing the literature and the way other people think, but just in a very pragmatic sense, 
If you watch the news, foreign news, you get a sense of how they interpret our politics. You get a sense of how they view us. And that really is important. And I, and I feel that the rest of the world is talking over our heads, that they have an understand, they understand us far better than we understand them. Uh, and so there's a certain, if you will, danger diplomatically, politically in that, that Anglophones are so isolated in their own little linguistic, uh, cultural, political bubble, uh, that there is a certain danger in it. It's interesting because you were talking about that and I was thinking about social media. It wasn't really started as social media. It was really social networks in the beginning. It was technology that uh, enabled uh, conversations uh, among people in different places. And so you brought your friends, right, into the network and you connected with them. And then uh, the, the commercial aspect uh, begun um, and uh, the scale uh, potential uh, because it was the scale potential there. And so social networks became social media. And once they became social media, then the, the, this bubble concept uh, was, became very real, uh, you know, through that. Sure, and, and, and there, the, it, it has created all these bubbles. So there, if people are living in an echo chamber. They're just hearing what they wanna hear and they're not hearing anything from the outside. So that in itself, is harmful. You can argue it's harmful to, for democracy itself, you know, and democracy now is so fragile. Uh, the new book project I'm, I'm working on it draws out of the rise of English, and it draws out of particularly the chapter on the, the new scramble for Africa, uh, and looking at knowledge diplomacy, so it brings in the education angle and language as soft power in Africa, uh, and to what extent that's been used by China largely through the Confucius Institutes, by France, uh, by the British through you know, the British Council, and to what extent the United States has just been not sufficiently mindful of the use of knowledge diplomacy and uh, as a, not only as a form of soft power, but how to change it to use language and, and uh, education and knowledge in a different way that's much more even-handed and going into countries, say, in Africa, uh, and the danger to democracy if, in fact, certain countries like China are having such an influence on the growing young population on that continent uh, and, and reaching into their hearts and minds and changing their values in some way uh, that countries like the United States re really should be, or, the, or, uh, or the, the UK, should be really be mindful of, of what's happening there. So, um, so yeah, I think there's, you know, all kinds of downsides to English being so dominant and to Anglophones, monolingual Anglophones believing that that's just a, 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 it's, it's a, it's a comfort zone that they're not willing to break out of without seeing the dangers of it. Yeah, it sounds like what you were saying about Africa, the, it, there is some complacency uh, there uh, uh, on the part of Anglophones and there, there's some blindsiding uh, in terms of how the new, um, you know, there isn't just arms and, and weapons and wars to conquer um, other uh, places or other countries, but the, the, the soft power is can be more powerful. Oh, it's extraordinarily powerful. I mean, you know, countries have also used um, infrastructure building, certainly China has through the Belt and Road Initiative in, in Africa. Um, that's a form of soft power uh, as well, of trying to influence, influence other countries to feel more um, positive toward whatever country is, com whatever country is coming in. What I'm trying to do in the new book is something a little bit different, to be a little bit critical of that as well, of just using soft, knowledge as soft power 
uh, in uh, just for the the in a political sense, just to gain political a political foothold or preserve political power, but trying to look at it more in a, a sharing sense. You know, the United States and the administration now is saying we want to be partners with Africa. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be partners? Uh, and what does that mean for knowledge of how we define what knowledge is? Is it just Western knowledge or are we looking at these countries and, and trying to determine whether they have something to offer us uh, as well? Uh, so it's, this is a, 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 a bigger project, but getting back to, to the original, uh, your original question with regard to uh, Anglophone monolinguals, they're just totally um, unaware I think they're just unaware of the bigger world and what the implications for language and culture are in, in the larger world. It's, it's interesting because I've been talking, the pandemic was a turning point for many people because we had to stop and change how we did things or, you know, we just so much we couldn't do. And so that created a pause and there was a lot of reflection uh, going on. And one of the outcomes that I've seen in linguistic terms out of the pandemic was um, a lot of people with um, parents, grandparents, ancestors from different countries, uh, in my world, particularly from Europe, they started looking into, well, what would it look like if I could live somewhere else and just, you know, work online? And, uh, and so there is a lot of discovery of one's roots and going back to, you know, my grandparents were Irish, my parents were Italian or what have you. And people looking into what would it look like to get a double citizenship, for example, and, and live abroad for a while. That, well, that has become much more common. Some of my students tell me, particularly students who have ancestors from Ireland, it's very easy to get a, a, a dual citizenship and, and to gain citizenship from Ireland. Much more difficult in Italy. Yes. Much, much more difficult to gain uh, Italian citizenship. There's lots of proof that you have to present. Uh, but uh, it was found that during the pandemic, more people were learning foreign languages, that they had more time and said, well, you know, maybe now's the time to, to learn Spanish or French or Italian or whatever. So those online courses became extraordinarily popular during the pandemic. It remains to be seen, you know, whether that continues or not now that people have gone back to almost normal life. Uh, that remains to be seen. But there was an uptick. I had hoped, and I, and I wrote about it in the book as well, that with um, companies like Netflix producing so many foreign movies, that this would encourage Anglophones to learn other languages, but there's dubbing available too. So I don't uh, know, you know, how, you know to what extent uh, all these movies and series that are being produced and, and in a, a, a large number, if you look at Netflix, they've produced a large number of these series and films in foreign countries, which are really very interesting across foreign countries. But I just wonder how many Anglophones are just saying, well, it's just so easy to, to listen to the dub version. Why bother learning the original language? That's interesting you should say that because right now I'm watching uh, Balthazar which is a French uh, version of what uh, people here may know as Silent Witness, which is a British um, series, but it's about forensic pathology. And I'm enjoying the French version so much more because there is that cultural nuance. Now, I don't speak French fluently, uh, but my parents used French because at the time when they went to school, that was the diplomatic language. So they both studied French in different schools at different times. And so they used French as their private language. Did and they of really? course, 
They did. And of course, we were children. So children pick up stuff really quickly. And when your parents switch to a different language, you know that they're saying something they don't want you to understand. (laughs) So so that's how I picked up French. I can't speak it, but I understand a lot of it. Well, in my family, the, uh, the private language was Italian because my grandparents did not want the grandchildren to speak Italian, we had to be very American, which really was an incredible loss. It really was an incredible loss. But I always knew when my mother was speaking Italian to her parents that there was probably some juicy family gossip. That's what I thought. (laughs) So were you one of the people who picked up a different language or uh, to brush up a different language during the pandemic? No, I mean, I've always been, um, I, I've, I've always gravitated toward other languages. So I, you know, I, okay. I, I studied French from a young age in school. And so, and then majored in French in, at the university, but, and, and picked up Italian at the university. I didn't, as I said, I didn't pick it up from my family at all. Uh, and then studied Spanish at the university as well and studied Latin in high school. So I've always been um, someone who was very torn, uh, very attractive toward languages uh, in general, and then ended up with a a doctorate in linguistics before I went to law school. Uh, And that's the the science of language. Yes. Yeah. So I I don't think the pandemic um, maybe gave me more time to watch uh, French films in particular, yeah, maybe it gave me more time to do to do that. Yes, I so German was my minor, so I went to Duolingo, and I started <laughs> from scratch because if you don't use a language, you don't. It already in German is really difficult to to maintain, um, especially since I didn't have exposure as a child. So I uh, I went and did the Duolingo stuff no i still i still watch uh france 24 in french just to keep my ear uh i still there's uh, another program under linguistica news in, in slow french and news in slow italian uh that i do when i'm on the treadmill <laughs> so it gives me something you know I, i'm doing something useful on 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 the treadmill uh, so I, I still try to access those kinds of programs to just keep up my ability uh, and just keep my ear, you know, because I don't have the opportunity to use it. I just wonder how much the enthusiasm for foreign languages amongst particularly Americans uh, la- outlasted the pandemic uh, or whether that was just kind of a, a time filler for them. Anecdotally, I would tell you that it was probably a time filler um, because I find I find that is right next to the reading more, (laughs) reading more books. (laughs) Um, People stop reading um, as much. Um, Even long articles um, are, you know, kind of you hit the wall uh, when you write, write a long article. People just don't read it. They scan it. Well, we were all so isolated, so we didn't have much of a social life. When you think of how much time you would ordinarily spend in your social life of of going out to theater or going to, you know, a concert or meeting with friends or inviting people to your home, all of that was gone. So there was lots of time there to fill in with other other activities. Uh, and maybe that was good. Maybe that there was, you know, if I had to think of, you know, look at for a, uh, a silver lining in that cloud uh, that it permitted it or forced everybody to to step back and kind of life stopped a bit and slowed down uh, and to rethink what might be important to you. Yes. Well, I think this is an important book. It's uh, very well researched. Uh, so thank you so much for your time today um, to talk some about some of the uh, main chapters or the main phases of your research. 
uh, be behind it. And I look forward to your next project uh, on, on power. That uh, sounds intriguing to me. I would um, encourage listeners to uh, pick up uh, a copy of The Rise of English. Um, it's a thick book. But uh, don't be discouraged. The chapters are very uh, easy to identify. Uh, so uh, sometimes I find that if I go right to the chapter that I want and then I go back <laughs> to, uh, to another chapter, uh, I, uh, I make it through um, the, the, whole, the whole thing. Yeah, well, thank you, Valeria. I think that's, that's the way I wrote the book and hoped that readers would look at it because it is a big book. But... There, there are chapters that would uh, interest a whole variety of people, you know, who would just go to the chapter on the new scramble for Africa or on dual language programs in the U.S. or the uh, Shakespeare in the Crossfire or looking at the Nordic countries. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there are chapters of interest to a, a very wide audience. Uh, but I want to thank you for inviting me. This really was a pleasure for me to talk to you. Thank you very much, everyone. You've been listening and watching uh, a conversation on value. I'm your host, Valeria Maltoni, and I hope you'll join us again for our next conversation on traces and dreams. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your network and subscribe. <laughs>